welcome to the third episode of Toke Signals TV, where we bring you the biggest cannabis stories of the week. My name is Steve Elliott. I am editor and host at tokesignals.com, and I'll be bringing you the news. But before we get down to business, let's have a little fun. Let's look at our bud pick of the week. And this week, we are looking at a beautiful flower of the strain permafrost. This photograph was taken by cannabis photographer Bob Montoya from the Seattle area at Montoya Studios. Bob works with Northwest Leaf Magazine, my friend Wes Abney over there, as well as a bunch of other publications. And as you can see, he does excellent work. The permafrost strain, depending upon whom you ask, is a 70% sativa strain. It is composed of either Northern Lights times White Widow or Trainwreck times White Widow. Once again, depending upon whom you ask, I can tell you that it is a quite medicinal strain. It is very effective. And I can also tell you that Slappy, the breeder who bred this flower here that you see in the picture, is an excellent breeder. He works with an outfit called Secret Seeds Collective Garden, which is based in Seattle. And if you would like to get these genetics for yourself, if you're a registered Washington medical marijuana patient, you can be growing this yourself in your own garden. Now it's on to the news. One of the biggest stories of the week and one of the most tragic that we'll be seeing this year happened this week in Texas where a two-year-old little girl died after being taken from her parents because they smoked pot. She was placed in an abusive foster home and she lost her life because of the system taking her away from her parents. The war on marijuana claims many victims. When it takes a little child like this, this is one of the most difficult things for us to handle. Because the parents smoke pot in their Round Rock, Texas home, this little girl is dead now and that is not acceptable. It is not okay for the state to take the children of pot smoking parents for no other reason than because they choose to mar use marijuana in their own home. This little girl Alexandra Hill was taken away from Joshua Hill and his wife for neglectful supervision simply because they admitted using marijuana in their own home while the child slept. This wasn't while they were supervising the little girl. She was placed in an abusive foster home contracted by Child Protective Services. Joshua Hill, the dad, said she would come to visitation with bruises on her and mold and mildew in her bag. It got to a point where I actually told CPS that they would have to have me arrested because I wouldn't let her go back. After repeated complaints by Joshua, Alexandria was placed in a second foster home with a lady named Cheryl Small in Rockdale, Texas seven months ago. Then on Monday night this week, little Alex was rushed to a hospital with severe head injuries. On Wednesday night, she was taken off life support. They wouldn't tell me what condition she was in or what was wrong or what had happened, Joshua Hill said. The only thing they would tell me is that I needed to be there. When I got there, I found out that Alex was in a coma. Police said the foster mother could not explain Alex's severe injuries. Another foster child was removed from the home on Monday. The private agency, Texas Mentor, which had placed Alex in two abusive homes, had 15 deficiencies for its August branch during the past two years, according to Texas state records. Four of those deficiencies were for failing to perform proper background checks on all foster homes. Joshua Hill admitted that he and his wife smoked pot while little Alex slept. But he said, we never hurt our daughter. She was never sick. She was never in the hospital. And she never had any issues until she went into state care. Let's hope that a tragedy like this can wake us all up enough to keep it from happening again. Just because parents choose to use marijuana in their own home does not mean they are unfit. We have to change this. Moving on to the next story. 
Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who is the medical marijuana correspondent for CNN, was known for several years as a staunch anti-marijuana person. In fact, during the Prop 19 debate for legalization in California, he came out against the measure and wrote an editorial explaining his position against marijuana legalization. Well, Dr. Gupta has now changed his mind about pot. This week he reversed his position on medical marijuana and he now endorses its use in a new essay and in an upcoming documentary film. The doctor said, we have been terribly and systematically misled for nearly 70 years in the United States and I apologize for my own role in that. I didn't look hard enough until now, he wrote. I didn't look far enough. I was too dismissive of the loud chorus of legitimate patients whose symptoms improved on cannabis. He's working on an upcoming documentary film called Weed, and the preparatory work for that film required that he speak to medical leaders, experts, growers, and patients. And the doctor now believes that it doesn't have a high potential for abuse, and there are very legitimate medical applications for marijuana. In fact, Sometimes marijuana is the only thing that works, Dr. Gupta said. He pointed to research indicating that only 9 to 10 percent of adult marijuana users become dependent, compared to 20 percent of cocaine users, 25 percent of heroin users, and 30 percent of tobacco users. He specifically endorsed the use of cannabis to treat cancer, neuropathic pain, and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD saying it's irresponsible not to provide the best care we can as a medical community, care that could involve marijuana. It's always good from a, a public awareness point of view when a highly visible MD such as Dr. Gupta changes his stance. And although he's late to the party, we're glad that he finally arrived. More news from Illinois, which just legalized medical marijuana with a bill signed by Governor Pat Quinn last week as we covered here and now less than a week later the first medical marijuana clinic is open in Illinois in the Chicago area. Now it's not a dispensary you can't buy pot there and you won't be able to legally buy medical marijuana in Illinois until next year. What this is is an authorization clinic it's called Good Intentions LLC. It's located in the Chicago suburb of Wicker Park. And patients can go there to start a relationship with a doctor who can eventually authorize them for medical marijuana. The Illinois medical marijuana law is written such that an ongoing existing relationship with the authorizing physician must be present. So what Good Intentions is doing is accepting patients now to start developing, establishing that relationship so that when the time comes to get their authorization, patients can hopefully do that. We want to establish a relationship between the doctor and the patient, especially those patients that don't have a primary doctor or have a doctor who is not comfortable with signing the recommendation. According to a spokesman, Tammy Jacoby, who works for Good Intentions, since Illinois' medical marijuana law requires that that existing relationship with the authorizing physician be in place, Good Intentions is trying to be proactive in laying this groundwork. A possible complication is that because the rules for the prior relationship with the doctor who authorizes the patient for medical marijuana haven't been established yet, nobody can say whether what's going on at Good Intentions will qualify those patients for a quote-unquote prior relationship with the physician when Illinois medical marijuana law goes into effect next year. But they are going to take their best guess and try to lay that groundwork and educate their patients about the program. Good intentions can't dispense marijuana under Illinois law, though patients will probably be able to get authorizations from them eventually. And once they have those cards, they'll be able to use those at one of about 60 state registered medical marijuana dispensaries which will be opened all over the state after January the 21st, 2014. The screening process for operators of these dispensaries is still up in the air. There are a lot of questions that still remain and law enforcement of course is expressing its own concerns about background checks that might go 
for dispensary employees. It's still a very much a, a developing situation on the ground in Illinois, but it is a significant development to have their first authorization clinic already open after less than a week. Moving down to South America, things continue to develop rapidly in Uruguay, which as we covered last week has also been moving towards legalizing marijuana and becoming possibly the first nation on earth to fully legalize it. The bill which would legalize marijuana in Uruguay, which is expected to pass and be signed by President Jose Mujica, also does something else. It fixes the price of government soul pot at the equivalent, the local equivalent of about 250 a gram. The bill's already been approved by the House, the lower chamber in Uruguay. It's expected for approval in the Senate and expected to be signed by the president. It puts the government entirely in charge of the marijuana industry from cultivation to consumption. Individual citizens, cooperatives, and private companies can grow a specified amount of marijuana each month, but as far as retail sale of marijuana, that could only be done by state-run pharmacies. Those who want to buy marijuana will have to register with the government in Uruguay, and they'll be limited to buying 40 grams per month. These regulations could keep Uruguay's estimated 120,000 cannabis users from going to the black market, and that's where the 250 a gram price scheme comes in. The government has two tools at its disposal to lure customers away from the black market and to the newly legal market, the soon to be legal market. Those are affordability and quality control. The current cost of black market pot in Uruguay varies by region and can go up to about $5 a gram, according to Julio Calzada, who's the drug czar there in Uruguay. The 250 per gram price is on par with the average rates nationwide underground, according to Calzada. And the hope, of course, being that competitive pricing will attract users to the legal market without also in the process providing them with a profit incentive for black market resales of pot they have bought legally. So the situation is developing in Uruguay. They apparently are going to legalize and the government will be selling pot for an affordable rate there. And of course we'll be watching that closely as it develops. There is a developing story here in Washington state where of course voters last November approved I-502 which in a limited way legalizes the adult consumption, recreational consumption that is, of marijuana. Washington has had medical marijuana for almost 15 years and patients have dispensaries, patients are allowed to grow up to 15 plants, patients can have a pound and a half. I-502 is separate from the medical marijuana law. It's recreational marijuana, legal for anyone 21 or older. And under the terms of I-502, you can possess up to an ounce. The only legal place to get pot under I-502 will be from state licensed marijuana stores. Those aren't open yet. The rules for their operation won't be fully developed and available until December. The stores are expected to start opening early next year. Now, during the campaign to pass I-502 legalization in Washington, the Pro-502 forces said that the new legalization law for recreational purposes for all adults wouldn't negatively impact Washington's medical marijuana community. That promise didn't last very long after the law passed because soon after it passed, those in charge of the program at the state government level realized that they would in fact be in competition with the medical marijuana market. To compete price-wise, they are now thinking about taxing medical marijuana the same way that they plan to tax recreational marijuana. And of course, in the opinion of many, the tax scheme for recreational marijuana is overtaxation. Since the cannabis will be taxed 25% at each stage of the process, cultivation, processing, which is the drying and curing 
of the flowers and retail will each be taxed 25%. So we're looking at a substantial tax burden by that point. Now what's going on basically is that the Washington State Liquor Control Board, which has been put in charge of implementing legal marijuana and its distribution in the state, plans to overtax recreational marijuana. So in order for their overtaxed, overpriced pot to compete, they want to overtax medical marijuana as well. Now, as I said, this is despite the promises last fall from backers of 502 that the measure would not impact the medical marijuana community, that these would be two separate systems. But now, the refrain that we're hearing from state regulators and from the Liquor Control Board is that we're hearing how the medical marijuana business in Washington is untaxed and unregulated and how crucial it is that we bring it into line, quote unquote, with the recreational markets rules. Steve Surich, who heads up the Cannabis Action Coalition, really gave the Liquor Control Board an earful on August 7th at a public hearing on implementation of I-502 rules concerning Washington State legalization. We have the video on tokesignals.com and it's worth checking out. It's about seven minutes long searches address to the public hearing. He told them, you had an opportunity this session of the legislature to get that tax reduced, to be competitive. Did you do anything about it? Absolutely not. Sir, it said that they never responded to any of the issues he raised. And he said the reason they do, didn't do that was because they don't have the answer. And it seems that all too quickly, promises of not impacting medical marijuana patients were forgotten and tossed aside once the state saw dollar signs around the taxation of pot. The fact is, many medical marijuana patients of course, being seriously ill, you have to have a serious illness in Washington state to qualify the way the law is written. They are on fixed incomes. They have limited discretionary income. And to make the price of their medicine higher at this point would place a real hardship on them. Right now, medical marijuana averages around $10 a gram in the state of Washington it could quickly become unaffordable for many of the people who seriously need it the worst for medical reasons if the recreational marijuana tax is also imposed on the medical market. That's something that we have to keep them honest on. We have a shocking story this week from California where special needs teens were entrapped in an undercover drug bust in a local high school there. Chaparral High School had an undercover narcotics officer come in and pressure students to find drugs. This has caused such an uproar in the community. It's raised questions of ethics and accountability, the waste of taxpayer dollars and the impact of this on students and their families and why exactly the police felt it was so important to entrap and arrest these students. What happened was a 17-year-old autistic student at Chaparral High School, along with other vulnerable special needs students, were entrapped by an undercover officer. This officer from the Riverside County Sheriff's Department posed as a high school student and pretended to befriend this socially isolated autistic teenager and immediately started urging him to sell him his prescription medication. The student refused, but after much persuasion, later got a small amount of marijuana for his new friend. His parents, aware that he struggled socially with his autism, with making new friends, were thrilled that he suddenly had this new friend. He, he had a friend who was texting him around the clock, his father, Doug Snodgrass, told ABC News. They thought that he had finally started to come out of his shell, but his new friend, Daniel, turned out to be an undercover cop with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department who hounded their son to sell him his prescription medication. As I said, he never would, but finally was convinced to buy marijuana for him. 
The undercover officer gave the kid $20. Under pressure, he found half a joint for his new friend. His mother, Catherine Snodgrass, said that the kids at school, because he was such an obvious narc, called this guy Deputy Dan. But it wasn't obvious to their autistic son. He didn't pick up on that. In total, the autistic 17-year-old and 21 other students were rounded up in the undercover sting. They were arrested and charged with drug-related crimes. The autistic kid was given 20 hours of community service and informal probation, but he was also expelled from school. Since being allowed back in school, he has been bullied via suspension and threats of expulsion, according to his parents. Even though he was cleared on the criminal charge, the school continues to try and expel him. Tony Newman, director of media relations with the Drug Policy Alliance, said that sending police and informants to entrap high school students is sick. We see cops seducing 18-year-olds to fall in love with them or befriending lonely kids and then tricking them into getting them small amounts of marijuana so they can stick them with felonies, Newman said. The behavior in this whole case points to troubling trends in drug enforcement, according to Stephen Downing, a retired chief of police from the Los Angeles Police Department. It is evidence of just how far we have gone and how callous we have become in treating our children with the care and dignity they should be entitled, Downing said. A community hearing has been scheduled for Monday, August the 12th, at the Community Recreation Center in Temecula, California, in response to the drug sting. The Temecula Valley Unified School District authorized this undercover police operation, which resulted in the arrest of these 22 students. And as I pointed out, a number of them were autistic or have special needs. So you have upset parents, you have community leaders and experts who will speak and take questions from the audience about the devastating impact of these arrests on these students and their families. And they plan to propose humane and effective alternative strategies. The public hearing will be called Accountability in Our Schools. Is TVUSD using our tax dollars to help or harm children and families? And it's designed to bring attention to the impact of these arrests. This will be from 6 to 8 p.m. Monday night in Temecula, California. And hopefully the school district can find a more productive way to go forward than entrapping and arresting its own students. Last of the stories this week is a fun one. Seattle Hemp Fest, the biggest pot protestable in the world, is coming soon to Seattle. It'll be in downtown Seattle August 16th, 17th, and 18th. That's next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at Myrtle Edwards Park on the waterfront. It'll be a little bit of a protestable and a little bit of a celebration this year, according to uh, organizer Vivian McPeak, because of the passage of legalization measures in Washington State and in Colorado in 2012. They expect up to 250,000 cannabis enthusiasts in the park. And I've been several years to Seattle Hemp Fest. Let me tell you, there are a lot of people there. It is a big party. And if you enjoy big crowds and camaraderie, you can have a hell of a time at this place, I promise you. They're going to do something a little bit special this time. They're going to use the human microphone call and response pattern of communication that was employed at Occupy Wall Street demonstrations. This should be fun. They're going to use this to send a message to President Obama that it's time to end Schedule One designation of cannabis under the Uniform Controlled Substances Act. More deaths are caused each year by tobacco use than by all the deaths from HIV, illegal drug use, alcohol, motor vehicle injuries, suicides, and murders combined, according to Vivian McPeak, the executive director of HempFest. Alcohol use is the third leading lifestyle-related cause of death of the nation. Yet those two dangerous drugs, alcohol and tobacco, have been exempted from the federal schedule entirely. Why is cannabis considered a Schedule I drug with no accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse under federal law? That just doesn't match up with the science. It doesn't match up with what we know about cannabis. It's nonsensical and it has to change. This is the message that the attendees at HempFest will be sending President Obama this year. 
Lots of politicians have admitted to recreational marijuana use. It didn't wreck their lives. It didn't burn out their brains. Mayors, governors, members of the House of Representatives, senators, at least three presidents, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, have admitted that they used marijuana in their youth. These prohibitionist policies have res not resulted in the unavailability of marijuana or, frankly, of any other drug. Those who wish to find drugs can find them, and the price of prohibition has been loss of civil liberties, high incarceration rates, and the loss of potential that locking someone away in a cage represents. You should be aware, if you attend Hemp Fest, that marijuana sales are prohibited at the event. You can be ejected for selling marijuana at Hemp Fest. There is a large amount of civil disobedience which occurs at Hemp Fest. And what I mean is, lots of people smoke pot openly. There are very few arrests unless you really push it. You don't want to go up and blow pot smoke in a cop's face or something foolish like that. But if you're a part of the crowd, it is very unlikely that you're going to get busted for smoking the joint. Now, you may be thinking, wait a minute, I thought marijuana was legalized last November in Washington. How could you still get busted? It is still illegal in Washington state to publicly smoke marijuana. So the possibility exists for arrests happening. As I said, since in past years, they were very infrequent. It's expected that they will be this year too, especially with legalization. But that doesn't mean that you need to push your luck. You need to use some common sense and you can have a good time if you just basically keep your head. If you want to bring some water, if you want to bring some sunscreen, those are very good ideas. Myrtle Edwards Park is long from end to end. There will be lots of walking involved. There will be lots of dealing with crowds. So you're going to have a better time if you stay hydrated and keep yourself from getting sunburned. If you do these things, you can show up and you can have one of the best times of your life. And this will be one to remember. It will be the first Seattle Hemp Fest post-legalization in Washington State. So if you can get here, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be a party. Before we close out this week, Let's look at a couple of things that you should check out on tokesignals.com. One of those is by our guest writer, Anna Dawn Garland, who's contributed about half a dozen good pieces so far to Toke Signals. One of her best appeared this week, Marijuana Legalization in Washington State, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Anna Dawn takes a look at the six main players in the drama that is Washington State legalization the politicians, the business owners, the medical community, the media, the marijuana advocates, and the citizens. And in each of those six groups, she takes a look at examples of the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's well worth your time to read, and um, it's gone over really well with our readers. You might want to check that out. Another story you don't want to miss this week on Hope Signals is by guest writer Sharon Letts, who has distinguished herself with cannabis writing throughout the community in many places. Right now, Sharon is involved in writing the biography of Dr. Molly Fry. Dr. Molly Fry is an interesting figure, and she's a tragic figure, because right now she is serving a federal prison term. She was incarcerated in May 2011. She's serving five years for manufacturing and distributing marijuana in California, a medically legal state where she was operating under the medical marijuana law. However, she, she was tried under federal law. Dr. Fry was not allowed a medical defense. At the time of the raid on her family home, she was growing 34 plants in a small greenhouse on a rural property outside Sacramento. She was medicating for a double mastectomy and subsequent chemotherapy treatments. And she was sharing her harvest with needful patients at no charge. Dr. Fry's lineage includes seven generations of physicians from both sides of her family. Her grandfather, Francis M. Pottinger, founded internal medicine in this country. And what she was doing when she was arrested was providing for her own medical needs and for those of other patients who couldn't afford marijuana. 
She was in prison for five years under federal law. She's still serving that prison term. And her important story, her story of heroism and sacrifice and helping those in need is currently being written by Sharon Letts, the biography of Dr. Molly Fry. It's called Faith in a Plant, and you want to check out chapter three of it this week on Toke Signals. That wraps things up for us this week. Don't forget to send in your bud pick of the week candidates. We're going to be taking a look at all those. Your bud could be famous. And in the meantime, as we go through this week, stay lifted. <laughs>